entities. We therefore look forward to hearing about Bobo's views on the future of Indonesia in the next 20 years. It is now my pleasure to invite Papa Prabowo Subiaco to address us on Indonesia facing the future, challenges for the next 20 years. Prabowo, please. outside of Indonesia. So you can imagine uh, <laughs> you, you can imagine how nervous I am and also the fact that there are so many distinguished eminent persons here in front of me. I feel like I'm in an oral examination. <laughs> I also feel that I'm being evaluated fit and proper test. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to be invited and uh, my advisors have been very busy advising me. Uh, the biggest debate, and that's the best choice, how should I dress for this occasion? <laughs> Usually in Indonesia, I, I go around in, in a short sleeves safari, you know. And I said, I want to come in a safari. No, no, no. You must look presidential. <laughs> so this debate has been going on for three days and three nights. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. Until a few hours ago, still, shall I wear this, shall I wear that? No, you must wear Baltic, nationalist, Indonesia. And then I remembered my father who told me, uh, it's never wrong to be overdressed. But I don't think I'm overdressed today. <laughs> I hope I look presidential. <laughs> I think I have the required red tie on. I've been asked to talk about Indonesia and Singapore. And I would like to, first of all, uh, talk at some depth about uh, Indonesia, my views about Indonesia, because I think that uh, traditionally for the last maybe 40 years, 45 years, the relationship between Singapore and Indonesia has been very, very good. We are close neighbors. There is a symbiotic relationship between Indonesia and Singapore. Singapore has uh, very successfully transformed itself from a third world former British colony to a first world society as a hub of finance, business, science, technology. Indonesia, a big country, vast. Uh, so I think that um, whatever happens to one will affect the other. And therefore I think that I have to tell our Singapore friends or to explain my thinking, my reading of the Indonesian situation so that our friends in Singapore 
will understand what are the underlying currents that are driving the dynamics in Indonesia. If you see the macroeconomic indicators about Indonesia, one can be very satisfied, one can be very complacent, one can be bullish. We are the fourth largest country in the world. We have the size, the population. We also have a big uh, gross product. We have a GDP of nearly one trillion, the 16th largest in the world. Can you imagine the 16th largest in the world? I hope we do get at least one gold medal in the Olympics. <laughs> so, make no mistake, I acknowledge the capacity and the achievements of the Indonesian leaders and their teams and the managers that took Indonesia through these difficult times. We might be on opposing sides of the political spectrum. We might criticize each other. And sometimes, even within the family, you know, the rivalry becomes very bitter sometimes. That is human. But if you take a greater and a more uh, general overview, we will realize that actually we have not done so bad. From 97, 98, up to now, we have transformed ourselves into a modern democracy. We have tried to become a democracy with all the difficulties, with all the mess, with all the disappointments that that entails. And we have controlled some of the weaknesses that we face. So, I don't want to dwell always on the negative aspects. Now, with all these positive aspects, and with all these achievements that we must acknowledge, and we must give credit where credit is due, we must give credit to President Habibi, even though he was the one who fired me from my post. <laughs> but we must leave personal feelings aside. You know, in, in politics and in statecraft, personal feelings can never be dominant. We also must acknowledge the achievements of Gusdur, President Abdurrahman Wahid, for all of his weaknesses, he was a wise leader. I was also, in the beginning, confused by Gusdur. <laughs> I was close to him, but many times confused. But in the end, I saw an enlightened wisdom. As a Muslim leader, he advocated inclusiveness, he always defended minorities, and he was not afraid of doing so. That really taught me something for all the confusion that he gave me. And President Megawati, many people always underestimate her, but if we are honest and we see under her presidency a lot of economic decisions were resolved. And even now, whatever people say about the present president, who is my friend actually, I, I don't hide the fact that he, he is my friend. We don't agree on many things, but we respect each other. 
And we have to give credit that he has also managed the country in a mature and in a, uh, I would say, measured way. Having said all that, I have to uh, point out that Indonesia faces tremendous challenges, in my view. These challenges are not, it, it, this challenge, in my opinion, is our facts of life. The challenges that, that uh, I see are, first, the depletion of our energy resources. Second, the population explosion. And then, the third challenge, tremendous challenge, is the weak governance of our system. Inefficiency and corruption. I put under one heading, because it's all interrelated. And the fourth tremendous challenge that we must face is the structural imbalance of our economy. These four tremendous challenges we must face and we must overcome. I sense that the Indonesian elite does not want really to seriously address these challenges. I sense that the Indonesian elite now is being a bit complacent. There is growth, there is wealth, but these challenges, if we do not address these challenges, if we do not find creative, innovative solutions in the near future, I think that these challenges can be obstacles to our desire for transformation. Singapore has succeeded in transforming itself from a third world former colony to a first world society. We also would like to follow that path. But these challenges cannot be avoided. We must face these challenges head on. And we, the English elite, must look, we must be brave enough to face it and to find solutions to it. Not to hide our heads in the sand, hoping that these challenges will go away. They will not go away. They will be there for us, even if we do not want to address them today. Ladies and gentlemen, our energy resources, we will run out of oil in 12 years time. After we run out of oil, we can rely on our coal. We have a reserves of 79 years. Of course, this can also make us complacent. Oh, 79 years of coal. And we have 34 years of natural gas. Of course, if we do not have new discoveries and new production. My point is, when the oil is gone in 12 years' time, we will deplete our coal and our natural gas. And my advisors, my team of experts, have told me that when our oil is depleted, we will deplete our coal and our natural gas within 34 years. So, that will be one generation, one and a half generation. What does this tell us? Yes, we hear about new technology. We hear about new breakthroughs in science. We are hopeful that this science, this breakthrough in technology will come to us and we can make use of it. But, myself being 
a former soldier, taught always to be prepared for the worst case scenario. My point is, can a country of 241 million people afford to wait and rely on external sources, on external input, on external technology? I think that a country must stand on its own feet, must rely on its own resources, must rely on its own effort, must rely on its own discipline. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a challenge that we must address. There are several ways. We have alternate sources of energy, solar, solar cost is going down, yes, but again, we are dependent on foreign sources. Yes, we have wind, we have geothermal, hydropower, hydropower, we have significant <coughs> reserves, but if we total seriously the geothermal and the hydropower, it's around 44,000 megawatts. Our annual need for electricity alone is 55,000 megawatts every year, increasing at the rate of 5,000 megawatts every year. We can imagine in 20 years, we need 20 times 5,000 megawatts additional on top of the 55,000 megawatts. If we are to maintain a rate of growth that is required to drive the Indonesian economy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very serious uh, issue, very serious challenge that we must overcome. Second challenge, the second challenge is our population explosion. We are increasing at the rate of 1.6% 1, 1 per year, our birth rate. 1.6% is 3.8 million every year. In 10 years, there's an additional group of Indonesians equivalent to six times Singapore. Every 10 years, six times of Singapore will come on this earth. Looking at these figures, I really wonder why I'm running for president. <laughs> I always tell my friends, my family, anybody who's running for president for Indonesia must really get a psychiatric examination. <coughs> because the challenges are very vast. And many Indonesians and the elite do not want to talk about this. To be very frank, not many people are talking about this population explosion. It's as if business as usual, okay, why is there massive traffic jams in Jakarta? Why is the price of foodstuff going up? Everything, in my opinion, comes from a source, and the source is this population explosion. Why is there violence? Why is there... Uh, where, why are there riots? Small dispute? Big fight. Village against village, tribe against tribe, ethnic group against ethnic group. Why? Why? Because of the stresses of Population explosion. Malthus has warned us many, many years ago, but people do not want to acknowledge this dynamic. We must address our population explosion. For all the weaknesses of the Suharto regime, one of their achievements 
was the family planning program. If we do not address this public inclusion, whatever program we want to initiate will be ineffective. There will be a growing gap between our ability to feed our people and new mouths. Can you imagine 3.8 million new mouths every year? New schools, new, new clinics must be built. New jobs must be created. Ladies and gentlemen, any Indonesian leader must have the courage to face this fact in front of us. I think from all the top leaders, all the, par the parties in Indonesia, maybe my friends and myself in Gerindra, we are the only ones who are giving serious thought about this problem. Third, third is the weak governance, inefficiency, and corruption that we face. I call this the vicious circle. In Indonesian, it's called Lingkaran Setan, the devil's circle. Weak government leads to inefficiency, inefficiency increases corruption. Corruption means lack of development, lack of services, lack of infrastructure. This creates disparity. Many people in our country do not have clean water. They have to walk many, many miles just to have clean water to drink and to cook. In Tanjung Priok, in the capital city of the Republic of Indonesia, two hours from parliament, two hours from the palace of the president, Indonesian people have to buy their water to cook and to drink every day. This cannot be accepted in the 21st century. Disparity, disparity creates instability and we cannot have prosperity in, in an atmosphere of instability. Another is our system of government. In 98, we went all the way to liberal democracy, <coughs> headlong, you know, thinking that democracy is the panacea for all our problems. We went a bit, a bit too fast, in my opinion. For instance, if you see efficiency in the system, in China, the People's Republic of China, there are 33 autonomous governing bodies which govern 1.4 billion people. This means there is one governing body for every 42 million. In India, it's uh, 35 states and autonomous bodies governing 1.2 billion people. It's one body for every 34 million people. Indonesia has 49, eh, 497 autonomous governing bodies, regencies, Kabupaten and Kota. 497. One body for every 484,000 people. Can you imagine the efficiency? Each body must have their own legislature. Each body must have their own uh, Bupati's office. Some of the offices of our Bupati's are like the capital city of a country. When I go to some of these Kabupatens, I, th I think I'm in Putrajaya or somewhere. <laughs> I've been into into your Prime Minister's office. I've been there several years ago, many years ago. Some of the Bupati's office, five times the size of your Prime Minister. <laughs> <coughs> the 
This is an intrinsic weakness in our system. Do we have the courage to reform this? Or will the elite of Indonesia, okay, let's go on. Yeah. Will the, the body politic serve the people or the people serve the body politic? Will the politicians entrench themselves or can there be a new awareness that we must get our, our act together? We must cut down the leakages, the inefficiency, so that we can deliver basic services to our people. Corruption. I don't want to be somebody who denigrates his own people or his own country amongst foreigners. That was not my intention. This, I'm just conveying to you, this is the debate in the English society now. This is the concern of our people, that corruption has gone too far. From, from 33 governors in Indonesia, 17 are either in jail, under indictment, or awaiting under investigation. 17 out of 33. We hear there are another four or five being added to the list. Out of the 497 regions and mayors, 138 are either in jail, under indictment, or under investigation. That's 30% of our executive leaders. This shows us the level of corruption in our body politic. What this means is that basic services becomes degraded. Roads are bad. Infrastructure are bad. The people are suffering. This means, in the end, uh, uncompetitive economy. Nobody wants to invest in a country with bad infrastructure. For an illustration, it's cheaper to bring cattle from Australia to Jakarta than for me to, for one of my farmers, to ship cattle from Central Java to Jakarta. Can you imagine? Why? Because my farmers tell me, sir, there are 38 posts along the way from Solo to Jakarta. 38. Each making their own levy. So in the end, it's cheaper to bring cattle from Australia to the market. I think this is something that Indonesians must be brave enough to address. And I think that the general thing now is the sense of uh, sense of desire, the strong desire for change, the strong desire for clean government. Now I address the fourth great challenge, which is structural imbalance. Structural imbalance. I would like to give some figures to show the structural imbalance of our society, of our economy. Let us look at the circulation of money in Indonesia. 60% of all the money of the Republic of Indonesia circulates in one city, Jakarta. One city of 6 million people, 60% of all the money of Indonesia circulates in Jakarta. 30% in all the big cities of Jakarta, around 33 cities. The rest, only 10% circulate in the rural areas. However, 60% of our population live in the rural areas. This, in our opinion, is structural imbalance. There is, in structural imbalance, there is inequality 
there is injustice. How can 60% of the population live on 10% of the wealth of the country? Further figures. Again, 97% of those people who have bank accounts, their savings are less than $10,000. Less than 0.1% have savings of more than 500,000 US. This again, what I call structural imbalance. Again, 0.17% of Indonesians control 45% of our entire GDP. Again, imbalance. Another figure. Our state budget for 2012. Out of $120 billion state budget, only 3% is for agriculture. 3%. It's uh, 30, what, 34 trillion, 3.4 billion. 3% less. Whereas, 60% of our population live in the agriculture sector. Can you imagine? 60% of the population is allocated 3% of the national budget. This is not viable. This is injustice. This is not wise. This is a formula for misery. This is a formula for unrest. This will degrade social harmony. This is what we have to have the courage to address. And this is political will. This is a budget that is determined by the political leaders of the country. I, as the chairman of the Farmers Association, we just request from 3% the budget to be increased to 10%, not to 60%. 3% to 10% means an increase of 300% for government spending in the agriculture sector. Ladies and gentlemen, during the 15 years of the so-called reformation era after the Suharto regime, no real maintenance has been conducted in the thousands of kilometers of irrigation canals. 70% of the irrigation canals of Indonesia are now clogged by silt. It needs an input of around $50 per hectare. 50 to 100 US dollars per hectare, and we can increase the efficiency of agriculture by nearly 10%. This is what I'm talking about. Another structural imbalance, nearly 50% of our population are living below the poverty line according to World Bank standard. They're living below the World Bank standard of $2 a day. Yes, we can fix the statistics. We can play around the figures. We can say, no, 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 the real poverty line is not Two dollars a day is one dollar a day. No, 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 not even one dollar a day. Uh, we can live on 70 cents a day. This, I think, is a frivolous argument. The facts of life is that many Indonesians do not have access to basic services. So, what is the solution. I think Indonesians must have the courage first to acknowledge these challenges. Indonesian leaders must have the courage to look for an innovative, creative solution. I have been proposing for several years what I call the strategy of the big push because I consider that we have a window of opportunity. 
our window of opportunity, in my opinion, is around 20 years, 20 to 25 years. If in these 20 years we can get our act together, we can address our energy depletion, we address our uh... <coughs> ah, sorry, nerves, nerves. <laughs> Our population exploitation, and if we can address our governance issues, cut down corruption, and reform our economy to be more logical, to be more equitable, to be more just, then I am very bullish. I think that we can be very stable. We can be very strong, we can feed our people, and we can be an engine for growth, not only for the region, but in fact, for the world. I have been proposing a big push strategy, which I studied from the development histories of many countries, of the United States, of many Latin American countries, Brazil, Japan, China. In the history of their economic development, there will be one or two sectors in which they concentrate as their big push. China, under the emperors, had mega projects. The most strategic mega project that I read about was the Grand Canal that was uh, built from north to south, running through I don't know how many thousand kilometers. But this Grand Canal really unified China, really boosted Chinese economic development. One big push. United States, their opening up of the West, the building of the railroads from the East Coast to the West Coast opened up United States. After that, massive infrastructure, Tennessee Valley Authority, Hoover Dam, thousands of hectares of irrigation, cheap electricity boosted United States productivity and competitiveness. China, in the last 30 years, once again, concentrated on several sectors. Indonesia, we must have a sector that we concentrate our competitiveness. We do have competitiveness. We are a tropical country. We occupy 11% of the 27% tropical zone of the world. What this means is, that with proper technology, proper management, proper science, we can have three harvests every year in agriculture. The temperate countries, the subtrop, they cannot, they can have maybe only one harvest a year, at most maybe two. We can really feed our people in fact, it can even provide food for the world with proper direction and proper management. This is our competitiveness. We also must make use of negative aspects and turn the negative into towards positive. Sadly, we have 77 million hectares of destroyed forest. 77 million hectares of destroyed forests. This actually is an ecological and economic disaster for Indonesia and for the world. And sadly, every 10 minutes, even as I speak, there are six soccer fields. The forests, the six times soccer fields, six soccer fields every 10 minutes are being destroyed every 10 minutes. 
I've been speaking for how many minutes? 40 minutes? 4 times 6, 24. A forest the size of 24 soccer fields has been destroyed even as I speak. What do we do? Talk about it? Convene seminars, convene conferences. We must have a will to overcome this. So what I've been proposing so that our friends in Singapore will know, you know, that I'm not some ultra-nationalist, socialist, etc., etc. Although nowadays, even Obama has been accused of being socialist. Maybe that's a bit of a compliment to me. What I'm proposing is to transform part of this already destroyed forest into productive land. I can go through these figures, but I think this is not the forum to go into technicalities, but I prepared a written paper for the school, for Ambassador Desker. I hope it passes the examination. <laughs> Maybe I get a C plus or something. <laughs> What I'm proposing is a big push. Concentration. Destroy forest, transform productive land to produce biofuel and to produce food. Research has been done, latest research up to today. The three most important concern of the Indonesian people now is food, energy and jobs. I'm proposing to face this ecological and economic disaster head-on, transform the destroyed forest to productive land, thus creating first, self-sufficiency in food. Second, overcome our resource, energy resource needs when our oil is depleted, we can produce our own biofuel. And then, of course, in the 30, 40 years coming, there could be innovation, scientific breakthroughs, bringing cheap energy to us. Nuclear, we must think about it, because perhaps that is the way to go. But before we go nuclear, I believe we have an alternative method. Why? Because of the experience of our Japanese friends, sometimes the dangers of nuclear energy must really be factored in. But I think that we have to think about going nuclear, perhaps in the coming decades. The agriculture experts of the world say that one hectare of agriculture activity creates six jobs. Let us be conservative. I use four jobs per hectare. We can really create millions and millions of new jobs. My written program is a bit ambitious, yes. I would like to create 16 million hectares of productive land within 20 years. Can we do it? We must do it. We must try. Indonesia must have the courage to try. There are always leaders and people who will look for reasons not to try anything new. Every effort, every proposal is considered unworkable, impossible. But the Indonesian national leadership, the Indonesian leadership must have the will, the toughness, the character, the courage to think and to try to look for creative solutions. I was brought up in my younger days with the motto, Who dares wins? Siapa berani menang? And I think it is time for the Indonesian elite to have the courage 
to dare. Only by courage and tough character will Indonesia overcome these four challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, I have dealt quite at length with Indonesia's challenges and how I think the way to go through to overcome these challenges. Now I would like to address some remarks about Indonesia's relations with Singapore. I personally have some emotional attachment to Singapore. I grew up here as a small boy. My family was here. Uh, two of my siblings, my sister and my brother, graduated from high school here. Uh, my brother-in-law is a professor for the last, what, eight years, nine years, in Nanyang Tech. Is that right? Yes. So we have personal attachment to Singapore. Both my parents in their last years were taken very good care of by Singapore doctors and Singapore nurses. This we cannot forget. Uh, these experiences are, are with us a long time. I remember I went to elementary school here at the Good Shepherd Convent near Bukit Timah. It was a Catholic school. I remember the event very well because in the first days of my school, I got caught climbing a fence during break time. And I was brought before the mother superior. Can you imagine a boy of seven years old being brought before the mother superior? It was a daunting experience. And I, uh, I never climbed that fence again. <laughs> However, what I learned there was I intermingled with, with Chinese, Malay boys, Indian boys, British boys, was British days then, uh, Eurasians, was a Catholic school. So, in all my early developments, going to school in uh, Hong Kong, in, in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, there was always this mix of races, religion, languages. So, we were very comfortable. And uh, my brother actually looks Chinese, so whenever he walks in Hong Kong, they will speak to him in Cantonese. <laughs> and they were angry when he doesn't answer. When he, <laughs> they thought he was a snooty, you know, <laughs> anglicized, anglicized Hong Kongese. Ladies and gentlemen, this background, I think, uh, really uh, enforces in me a realization that uh, Southeast Asia is a melting pot. We have common destiny. And if we talk about Singapore um, Indonesian relations, basically the last 45 years has been a very good relationship. Especially I witnessed, I experienced uh, the New Order days, which really taught me something, that relations between countries very often is influenced, are influenced by the good rapport, the good relationship and friendship between the top leaders. I think the friendship, the relationship between Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew and President Suharto is very well known, if not to say legendary. And I experienced that as a serving army officer. I sensed the rapport between ministers, between army leaders, and it came down to us. I had the Singapore Defense Attaché maybe nearly every week in my office. We became friends. One time, there was a hostage incident in Papua, at that time was Irian Jaya, hostage incident. 
26 people were scientific expedition, 26 were held hostage. I think there were about uh, nine foreign citizens, German, Dutch, British, and uh, I was entrusted with the hostage rescue. And uh, one of my first reaction to ask my Singaporean friends for assistance. I flew here, I was received by the top leaders of the Singapore security establishment, sat down in front of them. The meeting I think was about 20 minutes. What's your problem? Can we help you? We asked for technical assistance. Done. Shake hands. No written correspondence. Now it can be told so many years later. Singapore sent a detachment to help us with, with very important technical assistance. At that time, some, some equipment we did not have. But this was an example of relationship, of rapport, of belief in each other. I think this must be maintained. Also, it's an open secret, I think, amongst my family, my colleagues, my close political comrades, it's an open secret that I'm a strong admirer of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. I have been from my young days. In fact, he was one of my heroes. I usually wanted to dress like him in, in white short sleeves. <laughs> I, I think it's also an open secret amongst my colleagues. When we formed our party, we really modeled it on the PAP. In, in fact, we even adopted the white shirt of the PAP. Why? Because we admired the struggle of the early Singapore leaders to create a successful, clean leadership for a third world country. And Singapore managed from a third world country transforming itself to a competitive first world country. Yes, there are people who say, oh, Singapore is small. Can't be compared. Yes, Singapore is small, but Singapore has no resources. How can a small country with no resources survive? Not even survive, but being competitive, being able to be productive, becoming a hub, becoming a leader in many sectors. This is something that we must not be afraid to learn from. I make no effort at hiding my admiration. And I think that uh, we have to learn from examples of success. We have to learn from the Chinese. We have to learn from the Indians. We have to learn from the Brazilians. I think that is the way to go forward. But we cannot be limited by theoretical or ideological formulas. What works in one country, what works in one economy might not work in our situation. Therefore, I've been criticizing some of our economic managers who in 98, 97, 96, 98, they wanted to copycat, to follow the successful experience of the Western economies. They followed, they wanted to follow the so-called neoliberal agenda or the Washington Consensus. This I criticized. I have criticized continually. And I think the events of the last years from 2008 up to the present has strengthened my belief that in economies, especially economies like Indonesia, we cannot have 
a laissez-faire approach to our problems. The government cannot just be a referee. I am of the conviction that a government must intervene in sectors where it is necessary to intervene to protect the very poor and the very weak, to stimulate growth in sectors where the private sector are strong, vibrant, let the private sector carry on. I do not believe in cutting loose that lay the golden eggs. If the private sector is strong, go ahead. Governments don't need to be involved in coffee shops or retailing, etc., etc. But does government have to support tourism? Well, in remote areas where there is no development, government, I think, should take initiative to prepare the infrastructure so that the private sector are attracted to come in. So we must approach it case by case and with pragmatism. In my opinion, we must adopt what works. What work, what can work, what will work, we must not be afraid to adopt. We must not be doctrinaire. That is my argument. I've been asked a few minutes before coming in, Pak Prabowo, are you a socialist? Yes. I, my father was a socialist in those days. I think Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was socialist in his younger days. I think, how can Asians at that time not be socialist? Yeah. But if I answer now, I say no. I believe in pragmatism. <coughs> I believe, basically, my belief is to take the best of capitalism and the best of socialism. Why? I know my constituents. My constituents are farmers, are small traders, shopkeepers. They are capitalists. They might be small capitalists. Their buffalo, their chicken, their goats are capital. They don't want collective farm. They want their plot of land. They want access to the market. They want credit. They ask for credit. They ask for access to market. They want infrastructure. So, actually, it is not a matter of capitalism versus socialism. No. I think the way to go forward is get the best of all philosophies. Look for what works. The main thing is good governance and good strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, I think what must drive us in our future relationship is the realization that our aspirations are the same. Both Singapore, Koreans, and Indonesians desire the same thing. We desire security and we desire prosperity. Every Singapore man and woman wants security and prosperity for them and for their children. That is the same aspiration of every Indonesian man and woman. Every Indonesian man and woman want to see their children grow up and go to school and have an honest and dignified job. Every Indonesian wants security in their old age. They want medical care. They need clean water every day. It is tragedy. It is a crime, in my opinion, that a government cannot provide clean water to its citizens. This is the challenge that we are facing. I think in Singapore, has succeeded very well. There is a symbiotic relationship. We have very good <coughs> friendship. I would say that maybe Singapore is a second home 
to many Indonesians. I know that my brother is a company incorporated here, maybe several companies. I think our economy is very much integrated. This potential, this good relationship needs work to be maintained. And we must maintain it. What guides us, what guides Indonesians, what guides me in my political thinking, in my policy thinking is the age-old wisdom of our forefathers. The ancient Indonesian forefathers taught us there's a saying, Tepos Liro, Tenggang Roso, which in essence means think of the difficulties of others. Think of the aspirations of others. Think of the feelings of others. If you do that, Tepos Liro, you think about the feelings of the others, the hopes, the interests and the aspirations of the others. This will guide you to maintain harmony and peace between you in your daily life, in your future. Tepos Liro, Tenggang Roso. We must, the Indonesian elite, the Indonesian leadership and the Singapore leadership must of course protect the interests of the Indonesian people and respectively the Singapore people. Singapore leaders must of course protect the core interests of Singapore and Indonesia must protect the core interests of Singapore. But in doing so, we must also understand each other. We must also accommodate each other. We must also try to think of the other's difficulties, the other's aspirations. If we do this, I think that we can enhance and maintain future friendship for the sake of our children and the children of our children. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Subianto for uh, an excellent uh, presentation this morning. I'm happy that he uh, agreed to overcome his concerns about making his first foreign speech outside Indonesia uh, and that he did so before this audience. Uh, as you would agree with me, uh, what he has done is given us a thought-provoking analytical assessment uh, of his aspirations for Indonesia's future. Uh, we had a fluent uh, and articulate analysis. And I'm also pleased that uh, Pak Prabowo has agreed to take some questions. Could I invite the first question, please? Uh, please, please, the gentleman in the white shirt over there. Yes. Pagi Pak Prabowo saya dari Indonesia. Kalau terkait tadi itu tidak ada tidak perlu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I'm very pleased. Please, please introduce yourself. Yes, my name is Chang Kamal. I'm independent, but uh, I'm independent. I'm not attached to any uh, academic institution, but I'm quite involved, quite involved in academic field. I think in EAI, I attended ICR's any institution here. So, uh, my first question is that you exercise a lot on the energy sector and resources. But you miss very important commodities. What I say is a strategic, strategic commodities. Indonesia control, together with Malaysia and Taiwan, to, to Thailand, the most strategic commodities in the world, rubber, tin, nickel. Without tin and rubber, or Toyota will stop production. The wheel of economy in the world will not run. So my question, my or challenge to you, because the challenge. <laughs> if that is an OPEC-like institution, do you think that is the OPEC-like, a regional OPEC -like institution for Asia for this strategic commodities, and the more so, all the future life, futures are in USA, Japan, or even Singapore. Even China has set up a future exchange 
in Shanghai. So to have the own control of our prices, I think this is a good, very good for you as our future president. I think to, to have a future, to control more future prices completely, you must address this strategic commodity, even coal price, new cars. Please, please go directly to your question. Okay, yes. second question <laughs> is that you address more, more than much on domestic policy. And foreign policy, you miss a lot, except with Singapore. But our president has announced, our president, SBA, has announced what he called uh, dynamic uh -huh. equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium is a very important concept. But I think economically, this is a disequilibrium. Economically, this is a disequilibrium world. Because, why? From the trade relationship, import and export, 80% of import and export, import and export trade of Indonesia are with Asia. Asia, 80% of two way trade of Indonesia are with Asia. And the trade oh, this year, the Indonesia trade with China, okay, I'll have, I'll yeah, have to, with Thailand, will be cut you short okay. and, and turn the flow over so that you How do you address this equilibrium instead of equilibrium? The third question is that no, I know this also. The president. No, 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 please, please take the seat, please. I have to give the floor to other people. Right. Thank you. Yes, I, I did not dwell too much on uh, commodities. Because I think that uh, Indonesia uh, should not continue relying on a commodities based economy. Because, yes, commodities will earn us revenue, living, some of it strategic, but there is what I said. Uh, a relevant challenge in front of us. Our energy resources will be depleted. If we do not address this now to prepare, 12 years is just, is 12, 12 times in the future, 12 times Christmas, is just in front of us. So, the strong communities that we produce, okay, it's good. As I said, what is good, what is strong, we don't have to dwell too long. The private sector already engaged, by all means go ahead. But the threat in front of us, we must prepare now. That's right. Do we need an OPEC for rubber, OPEC for tin, OPEC? I think there's already a movement towards that, right? But uh, whether it will be good, effective, etc., you know, that is still open for discussion. Yeah. So I'm still open-minded about it. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't, don't have too strong uh, positions on that. I'm very open-minded on that. And uh, your. Um, your second uh, issue of dynamic equilibrium. What does that mean actually? <laughs> <laughs> that means basically we have to be nice to everybody. <laughs> and that is actually a good philosophy. You know, I, I always, I learned sadly a bit late after I was forced into early retirement. I, I came about an ancient Chinese teaching. One thousand friends, too few. One enemy, too many. This is a paradox. This is, you know, I was one thousand friends, too few. One enemy, too many. I wish I had come across this earlier in my career. That. In the end, I think that is the wisest course. We must maintain friendship with a lot, with many people. So, is it dynamic equilibrium? We have to acknowledge the presence of the Americans. The United States are a Pacific power. They are an Asian power. There's a new China. That was its proper place in the world. 
We also must be friends. We must have cooperation with the Chinese. That is, that is a reality. So if that is what is meant dynamic equilibrium, yes, I am supporting dynamic equilibrium. If you say fairness in trade, fairness in... What I think is this. I think everybody must stand on his own feet. Everybody must take care of himself. We cannot always blame other people. That's why I'm talking more and more mostly about Indonesia. Because a strong, prosperous, stable, modern, modern Indonesia is an asset for the whole world. <coughs> but if we cannot take, if we cannot get our act together, how can we be respected? How can we go to foreign countries and and pretend that we are a viable partner? But if we succeed in addressing our domestic problems, <coughs> giving good governance, giving good services, creating social justice, creating a modern, modern state in harmony with each other, multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, living in peace, each striving for, for prosperity, then we will be respected. So, uh, make no mistake, it's not that I don't want to address foreign relations, I just want to go to the essence of the problem. Thank you. Yeah, short question. Uh, the way you define the role of the state in the economy, I was wondering how exactly is it implemented? Like going to uh, revive Bapanas and to strengthen a uh, set of industries like what we have here in Singapore. Second question, what is the most crucial thing that you think uh, SBA President Yudhoyono is failing and you promise not to repeat? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think you hit it on the nail. Yeah. Now I, I, I want to say something that that my close colleagues and friends can can vouch for. I'm not saying this because I want to please this audience. Yeah. I don't want to say this that I want to please Singaporeans. No. Yeah, I'm not that type of person. But to be very frank. I always use Singapore as my model. Certain, certain traditional capitalists and economic thinkers always are suspicious of state-owned enterprise. There is a stereotype in certain circles that state-owned enterprise means inefficiency means corruption. Singapore, you must admit, like it or not, have many state-owned enterprises that are world-class competitive. Singapore Airlines, you know, I have to acknowledge, is the best airline in the world for what, 30 years? 40 years? I think many people here will agree with me. Yeah, I think Garuda needs to learn from Singapore Airlines. So, Singapore Airlines, stay open. Compete against the best airlines in the world. Succeed. So, Port of Singapore Authority. One of, I think it's the biggest port in the world. I can go on and on and on. You know? So, I say to my people, hey, listen friends and colleagues, why do we go so far away to study models here and models there? We just cross the straits, fly one and a half hours. And Singapore has been here for the last 40 years. There's nothing new, it's been there. I happen to grow up here. So you understand, that's exactly what I mean. As I said, in areas where the private sector are not willing yet to go in, the government must be pioneer. For instance, I give an example. In this last seven days, eight days in Indonesia, big crisis, 
Soya bean prices. Soya bean is a very important part of our diet. Prices going up. Eight, nine years ago, I approached some of our top conglomerates, asking them to invest in a soya bean project. And one of them said, no, 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 no. we don't want to invest, but too high risk. Whether, because of the, uh, what they consider the unpredictability of the weather, they're not willing to risk. So what do we do? In my opinion, the government should have got up coming. Support new seats, new credits, organizers, field workers, technology, so that now we don't cry that we cannot afford, our people cannot afford soya bean. I just would like to emphasize this. I was talking to an economist from Indonesia that the majority of Indonesians pay 50% of their income for food. United States, the Americans, they pay 7% of their income for food average. Indonesians pay 50%. The poorer you go down, the lowest class in Indonesia pay 70% of their income for food. If there's a slight spike, they cannot pay for their children in school, they cannot pay for clothes, they cannot pay for water, they cannot pay for medicine. This is what I'm talking about. It's not that I don't want to address foreign policy. I can get some team to make nice speeches for me. <laughs> Dynamic relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Multilateral engagement. <laughs> I can do that and you, you will nod your head and go to sleep. <laughs> I, I'm saying that this is, this is what we are facing. 70% yeah. of, of income for food is terrible. It's sad. It's sad. It is sad. And once again, I, I don't know why I'm running for president. <laughs> Could I ask a question from that side of the, of the house? Please, uh, maybe. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, you announced it earlier, sir. Bapa Prabowo, as the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School, I'm delighted to be an admirer of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And I hope that you come to visit Lee Kuan Yew School also. Thank you very much. Uh, my question today is actually about other leaders uh, that you admire. You mentioned President Gustu was a very enlightened, inclusive Muslim leader. And I agree with you, because I knew him too. Uh, but as you look around the world today, and the other living Muslim leaders, and if you had to name the three living Muslim leaders today that you admire the most, who would you mention? Living? Living? <laughs> <laughs> In power or out of power? <laughs> Challenging question. Uh, Muslim leader. No, I want to say I admire Pak Mahathir Muhammad. I admire Pak Mahathir Muhammad. A tough, tough leader. Tough leader. Uh, living here. <laughs> Many of those I admired are gone from the sea. <laughs> well, go on. Well, I admired from history, I admired uh, Kamal Atatur. Yeah. Uh, I admired in Indonesia. Norbois Majid, a good friend of mine, senior mentor, uh, Wahid Hashim, the father of Bushdur, was key in getting Pancasila to be accepted by the Muslim community in 1945. A very key. Also, Haji Kusumo, leader of the Muhammadiyah, key also in achieving our uh, 
I mean, it ends in the early days. Uh, uh, Agus, Agus Salim, the Pia Haji Agus Salim, uh, also very enlightened, very visionary, very brilliant uh, leader of the Muslim community. Uh, many, many leaders that I admire, actually. That's why, you know, but to see now in the current uh, the current of, uh, of uh, current political situation in the world. Some of those I admire are not in current favor in their respective countries, so I have to be a bit diplomatic. <laughs> I hope I hope that it suffices. Billy uh, Thank you, uh, Papa Paul. I'm Mary Anthony from uh, RSIS. If I could just push you a bit further on uh, Indonesia's foreign policy, considering that uh, considering Indonesia's place in the region, and while we spoke about the need to retain uh, very good relations with Singapore, I think the audience and uh, many of us in the region would be interested to uh, to hear your vision about uh, Indonesia's leadership in ASEAN. If you're going to be the president of Indonesia, I think. Uh, thank you very much. I think in relations amongst nations. I think, in my opinion, uh, there must be, number one, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the realization that each country, each nation, has its own aspirations, its own difficulties, its own struggles. And to have good relations, we must understand and respect the aspirations and the difficulties and the core interests of our partners. That is the key, in my opinion. So you say leadership. Leadership is a two-way traffic. We cannot, but most nations say, I must be respected because I am bigger, you know, or I am, no. I think it must be a mutual respect and I think we must look for common interests. So, looking at the experience of the Europeans, looking at the experience of the Latin Americans everywhere, it's going to be a consensus building uh, effort based on mutual understanding of each other's aspirations and difficulties. So, I, I think that uh, it's not important that, uh, that Indonesia be acknowledged as a leader, blah, blah, blah. I don't think it's important. I think we will be respected if we can take care of our own people. If and when <coughs> Indonesia can achieve an equitable economic progress for the majority of our people, if we can minimize absolute poverty, if we can bring basic services to our people, we will be respected by our neighbors, our partners, and our friends. If we cannot do that, any posturing, I think, is irrelevant. And that's my opinion. So, I will try to concentrate in alleviating the difficulties of my people. And I think by doing that, we will be a good and stable partner for our neighbors and our friends. That's my, 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 my position. That's my attitude. Thank you. I'm from the Singapore International Foundation. Uh, I'm very happy that you mentioned water as a critical challenge, not only for Indonesia, but for the world region. We at the International Foundation we are launching a project called Water for Life. This is to bring water, particularly through technology, to the rural areas. We are launching the project in in Cambodia next week, 
and next month we will also be launching a project in Surabaya. So we hope to look towards cooperation with people, with young people of this important group. My question is, in this globalized world of today, is nationalism still the prevailing force in Indonesia? I ask this because in the economic field at least, quite a few investment ventures, for example, the DPS venture, you know, buying into an Indonesian bank has been less than smooth. So my question is, is nationalism the motivating force? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I am uh, very happy that uh, you are involved in water. Water is strategic. It's my main concern. Uh, so I'm very interested in your project in Surabaya. We hope to learn from, from you. I think Singapore also one of the success stories is that Singapore has uh, invested a lot of effort and uh, money into uh, water research. Uh, I was disappointed I couldn't make, there was a big uh, water conference, I think a few months ago, very strategic, uh, so I fully support uh, your efforts in Indonesia. If we can be of help, I have my senior uh, advisor here with me, you should uh, link up and, you, and how we can go forward on this uh, water. Water is the source of every civilization and uh, is key to, to my strategic uh, thinking forward. Uh, your second question is nationalism uh, important in, in the modern 21st century con context, context? I think nationalism is a reality. Nationalism means protecting the national interest and the people's interest. That, that is uh, logical. It's everywhere. If I remember a, a quote or a, 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 a teaching or a paragraph from <laughs> Professor Leah Robinson from Harvard to paraphrase her that real economic growth is driven by national interest. I repeat, real economic growth is really driven by national interest. Why China could maintain tremendous rate of growth for what? 30 years in a row is because of their national consciousness, of their national interest. They want to take their proper and rightful place in the world. The United States, how the United States achieve ascendancy? Because of their nationalism. Japan, and I can go on and on and on. But does nationalism turn into xenophobia? Does nationalism turn into the desire to exclude, the desire to cut off relations, the desire to be an inward-looking autarky? Many countries have tried to do that. And I think they realized that it was not really enlightened. I think national interest means also good relations with all partners and all interlocutors. So I have to tell you that there must be a strong national consciousness. Otherwise, what will hold a country as diverse and as strong as Indonesia, uh, as, as, as big as Indonesia. The key is, this nationalism must be moderate, calibrated, 
mature and not go into extremist levels. Basically, it's the desire for dignity. The desire for dignity. Every country, every people want to be respected. We were talking with Chairman Eddie Tiola last night that uh, when we were living here in Singapore, one of my sisters uh, was invited to a birthday party in Penguin Cup. This was in the 50s. And then the invitation was revoked because she was not white. In many clubs of Indonesia at that time, there was a sign in front of them. We had photographs. It was taught to us by our grandfather. We were taught, we were told before we could not go into this club, we cannot go into this restaurant because we were not white. And there was a sign in front of the clubs. Honden and inlander forbidden. Dogs and natives forbidden. So there is this nationalist element. We can understand now the Chinese drive for national greatness. At one time, they were bombarded in their cities by gunboats forced to buy opium. This will not leave the Chinese consciousness. My grandfather was humiliated day after day going to school. This will not leave us from our consciousness, but we take this as a lesson in history. We do not go this far with uh, a desire for recrimination and enmity. No. We have come to terms with the past, but the desire for dignity. Every country has a desire for dignity. Singapore wants to be respected. Indonesia also wants to be respected. So, yes, nationalism will be part of the Indonesian uh, reality, but the Indonesian leaders must not exploit nationalism into, uh, I would say, negative aspects. For instance, sometimes we are very sensitive and touchy by our neighbors claiming a certain song or, or a certain dance or a certain, you know, come on, dancing. And many people from, from Malaysia come from Indonesia, you know? So what? It's good heritage. I mean, Americans were, were kids. They came from Scotland or Ireland. They played the black part, back, oh, back pipes. I think the Scots and the Irish have no have no bones about it. Maybe they're proud. Hey, some Americans using clothes. So I mean we should be proud that some of our Malaysian friends do the way off or do the tor or do whatever. You know. So sometimes it goes to Irrational man. I do admit, my my people sometimes very emotional. <laughs> but it's the it's the law of us. We have to leaders must lead. Leaders are teachers also. So whenever whenever some of the young hotheads say, oh, no, 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 come on. We are proud that our dances is uh, being danced in other countries. Yeah. <laughs> And so what? So this calibration. But yes, there will be a nationalist in the positive sense that we want we want to protect our core interests, we want to protect our people, but we also know that we need we need foreign expertise, we need foreign investment, we need friendship, we need tourism, we need a lot of things. And I think the the wisest course is to maintain friendship and relationship with everybody. I would like to emphasize that Indonesia has traditionally been a very open country. It's our national character. Maybe 
also part of our weakness. When, when a guest comes to our house, we will do the utmost to make him feel comfortable. Maybe even going to the neighbor and borrowing some sugar, borrowing food, but we must receive guests with. That's the teaching of our culture. Sometimes it goes to, to ridiculous lengths, but I think I try to address your question like that. Arsenal. <laughs> I'm uh, original from RSS as well. Um, my question is actually related directly to your uh, reply, but also to your earlier reply to the question from Ambassador uh, um, uh, Mubani about uh, your, um, if you like, uh, your, your admired uh, Muslim leaders. It's related to the question of nationalism and the role that nationalism plays in Indonesia today vis a vis centrifugal forces in Indonesia. You talked about uh, Muslim. <coughs> Also, include people like Haji, Omar Said, uh, I think the crucial thing is that, that generation of Indonesian Islamists were also nationalists. And I think it's important to emphasize that there has been this uh, long history of a very strong Indonesian nationalism, which is, uh, in a sense, inclusive and centralist. The emphasis on a central, united Indonesian <coughs> republic, which I think is very important. Now, I raise this question now because you noted in your presentation among the challenges facing Indonesia is the question of weak government or rather decentralized government. And in the wake of what's been happening over the last few years, particularly as a result of decentralization, as you know, in Indonesia, increasingly more and more local authorities are using religion as a means of uh, establishing local power centers. Uh, the recent report, for example, in Tasik Malaya, that local authorities are demanding that all women, including tourists, uh, adopt Muslim dress in defiance of the central <coughs> government. So my question to you, um, and I agree with you, that nationalism is very important to Indonesia, because it's the one thing that glues Indonesia together. But if you were in a position of occupying the highest office in the country, what would you do to deal with this emergence of popular democracy across Indonesia, where local leaders use things like ethnicity and religion to, if you like, carve out little territories for themselves? We talked about the rise of this Upati culture. And as, as, uh, as a scholar who researches Indonesia, I agree with you. Uh, in some parts of, uh, for example, Central and Eastern Java, local government is, is even more powerful than central government at the local level. So how is this nationalism, this unite, uniting nationalism, uh, going to be put at work to deal with all these rising local demands that are increasingly being articulated in the name of religion? Because most Muslim governments worldwide always find it difficult to deal with anti-state demands if they are articulated in the name of religion. Because Politically, of course, in a democracy, that is potentially a very, very dangerous thing to do. Thank you. What I would like to answer is this. It comes down, it boils down to governance. A government that can deliver Basic services can deliver security and prosperity to its people, that government will prevail. I'm convinced of that. That's my conviction. Demagoguery, the use of sensitive primordial issues to entrench and enhance your political power is is historical. Many demagogues will stoop to the most vile levels to hold on to power for their gain and for their perpetuating their grip on, on power. And that's why I think there's a need for a new type of political leadership, enlightened, bringing good governance, incorruptible 
This is our challenge. If we can prove to the people at the most elementary grassroots level that there is a serious alternative to these demagogues, that they are actually charlatans, they are actually very crap. They got voted in and in their five years of administration, nothing is being done for the people. And so they will find all these tricks, all these type of shenanigans to get popularity. Maybe they will ban a dance or do this and do that. This is a challenge. That's why I said, weak governance, corruption is a challenge. If a nationalist government cannot provide good governance, good and clean, incorruptible administration, then this is an invitation for exactly the things that you mentioned, for exactly the things that you... So this is a race against time. This is a race for the Indonesian elite. The educated elite must have the courage to lead, to teach, to guide, and the people will follow. The people will follow. There will be a competition amongst these, as I said, these people who will use uh, primordial instincts as a means. Some are the ideological driven, yes. But in the end, it's going to be a race. Who can deliver the basic needs of the people? Again, this issue of governance. I would like to, to give an example. As you know, there's, uh, there's a current uh, election campaign in the capital city of Jakarta. Uh, my party, we selected a candidate, a former Bupati, who happened to be a Chinese Indonesian who is a Christian. But we selected him. Why? Because he was a successful Bupati in East Berito Regency. The interesting thing about this Regency is that it is 93% Muslim. You have a Chinese Indonesian who is a Christian being elected by a district that is 93% Muslim. I think that is heartening. Why? Because he was a clean and good leader. Then he ran for governor of Bangka Belitung. He lost by, I think it was 3,000 votes. Nearly became governor. Now he's running for vice governor, and I hope you will win. If and when that happens, it will show that our people are a bit more mature than many think. And it heartens me. It makes me more optimistic and bullish about the future. It reinforces my conviction that uh, our people will elect a clean leader. I will give you another Example, I come from, I live now in a village one and a half hours from Jakarta. The village is Bojong Kone. It was nine, it, it is I think 99.99% Muslim. But in the, in two elections, not in this election, in the 2004 elections, this, this area is 99% Muslim elected a lady who is Christian, the only Christian in that whole village, was elected to represent them in the state legislature, in the local legislature. I was surprised. You know? And this was a really strong stronghold 
of the Islamic party before. Why? I asked, why did you let this? No. She's always with us. Uh, when we, there's no ambulance there, uh, if one of our family is sick, she will bring our relative all the way to the hospital. She's very nice to us, she's polite. Da, 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 da. Our people, when decide on human, human to human relationship, this is my optimism. I think. We must make an effort, but the leaders must make an effort to lead. We must protect our heritage. We live in a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religion. That's our destiny. We, it's decided by hundreds of years. So, <coughs> I've been arguing this everywhere to Indonesia that this is not a choice. This is destiny. We live together and better we live in peace and friendship then we live in suspicion. And this example of East Britain and the example of the village that now I'm living in actually is heartening. Yes, there will be people who exploit this. There will be. But this is a challenge we have to face. Sometimes we cannot run away from challenges. We have to face these challenges and we have to be brave and courageous <coughs> to do the right thing. That is my, my answer to you, sir. Thank you. On that note, I will have to call uh, this Q&A to uh, draw this Q&A to a group. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Pak Prabhu for his articulate and uh, considered responses uh, to your questions. Uh, he has some strong views and he put them across. But I think we are particularly pleased that he was prepared to present his own uh, clear-sighted viewpoint to this audience today. Will you join me in thanking Pak Prabhu? As Pak Prabhu had mentioned that he had had some interest in, in Singapore's founder leaders, we decided that uh, 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 as a token of our appreciation, we would present with two books re recently written by RSIS on Dr. Go Feng Sui, one of Singapore's founding leaders.